Yeah, so you can't value a firm unless you understand some of the, you know, the SWOT analysis. Right? You can't understand the valuation of the firm unless you know who the leaders are and if they have a track record. Um, then you have your bank rank rankings. Here's your competitors right here. Um, so you know where B of A ranks, you know, by its peer. Uh, here's basically the breakdown by uh, revenue for the bank. So you know where its comparative advantages and disadvantages are. They're basically product segment. And which ones make up the majority of the revenues and which ones are growing the fastest. You gotta know that stuff if you're gonna value the company. Um, and then you got the products and services laid out, especially the ones that contribute the most to revenue, which ones are growing the fastest. Again, because it's all earnings projections, right? Or EBITDA per share, whatever metric you're using. Then you have your financial statement analysis, the fi overall financial conditions and position of the firm compared to your competition. So you have your direct competitor, you got your weighted average ratios, we use the assets to do the weighted averages, that becomes the peer group ratios. You got your industry ratios and then you compare the company's financial ratio against its direct competitor, the peer in the industry and you code it either good, either either excellent, good, above average, average, below average, or poor. <clears throat> Once you've done, conducted the financial ratio analysis, you come up with an overall financial condition and position of the firm based on the sample of those financial ratios. This is the first step in valuation in fundamental securities analysis. Then you have your second set. Again, you come to the conclusion that the overall financial condition and position of B of A is good. That's your first step within the fundamental analysis. Your first valuation technique is technical analysis. So you go back five years, three years, and you basically get the chart, the stock chart. You set the support lines, the resistance line, the channels, uh, the trading ranges, the supports, the resistance, the breakouts, the upside, the trends, and you basically conduct technical securities analysis, also including the RSI and the MACD that you also use. You basically come up with a summary, you project out where you think the stock price is going to go based on trend, you come up with the target price, compare it by the current price to get the uh, premium or discount. That's your first, just based on technical analysis. Uh, the next is the perpetuity model. You use the capital asset pricing model to come up with the cost of the equity, which is your highest discount rate. You use the um, Weighted average cost of capital to come up with your minimum sensitivity on the discount rate. And then usually the market, expect a return on the market, usually is somewhere in between. So we use a 100 basis point spread between the two. I project out what the earnings per share is going to be next year. Divided by the discount rates, I get the intrinsic valuations. Just using perpetuity, which assumes that the um, earnings per share are going to remain constant forever. Compare it against the current stock price calculate the premium to discount. But we don't use perpetuity because most firms have, have growing uh, earnings per share. So then we use the Gordon growth. Same scenario, but now you're using different growth rate scenarios, same discount rate scenarios, and come up with a valuation matrix. We decided that we were gonna use the 10%, 1% because B of A is so huge. That becomes our intrinsic value compared to the current stock price. It looks like that's wrong. That should have been a discount. Uh, multiple approach. We took um, last year's multiple, projected this year's multiple, next year's multiple, created a multiple grid to basically look at the data. Um, then what we did was we also projected out what we thought the stock price would be next year and the earnings per share next year, calculated a forward multiple on there too. Took all of that, came up with a range of multiples from high to low. Multiplied it against the earnings per share projection to basically get the multiple valuation compared it against current stock price, get a premium. Okay. Then what we did was the discounted cash flow approach. We did next year's EPS, five year holding period, projected out. Project it out one more year because you got to go to the sixth year to calculate the terminal value. At the terminal value, 
of the, com of the uh, share to the um, fifth year earnings per share, discounted back at the discount factor, 1.1 to the fifth power, do it for each one of these to get the present values, add up the present values to get the intrinsic value, compare it against the current stock price to get the premium. Okay. And we had, to, we had to go back and project out what the earnings per share growth rates were going to be over the six years to use the DCF. Okay. Then what we did was we, uh, we ran three scenarios, weighting scenarios on the individual methodologies. We overweighted um, the multiple approach and the DCF because we knew that perpetuity and Gordon growth were uh, too simplistic and that most equity analysts will use the multiple approach or the DCF to come up with their intrinsic values. So we ran three different weighting scenarios against the intrinsic valuation models to come up with the final intrinsic value, compared it against the stock price to get the premium, which was a buying recommendation. Uh, and then there's something happened here. Uh, this should be up here, here for the stock price. And then we, what we did is we said, well, we think the, prop, the stock price is going to go up 5%. And V of A makes up a significant portion of financial institution or financial exchange traded funds and financial financial exchange traded funds indexes, financial services. So our recommendation is to buy forwards on these financial services indexes, buy futures, buy calls on futures, and write puts on futures for four trades. Um, we're tracking and trading four financial services exchange traded funds. We're going to buy, buy on margin, buy calls and write puts. So we have four trades there too. And we're, um, tra we're trading the stock, the B of A stock. And we recommend buying, buying on margin by calls and write puts for another four trades. So we have a total of 12 trades that we can call up to our proprietary trading unit to trade B of A. Or to call our portfolio management division that's managing the uh, financial services, mutual funds, or exchange traded funds and say we should be overweighting B of A. Or call our clients that are accredited and qualified and say you should be buying B of A. Um, but we recommend that you you could buy the futures on the indexes or the calls or write the puts on the financial services, but we probably think that you should go ahead and just buy the stock on margin, buy the calls and write the puts. And really leverage our view. And if we're right, the clients and the proprietary trading units uh, make a lot of money. The uh, portfolio managers will outperform the S&P 500 because we've been making recommendations based on our intrinsic valuation research, which has allowed their uh, portfolio to outperform the benchmark. Okay. Then we have the references, um, and then we have a signing page. Uh, everybody's a CFA, CPA, um, so basically they have to sign off on the research because they're liable. So I make all my students sign their research, like you would if you were a CFA, CPA, or you know, uh, you have to you have to sign off on the research. And now because of Sarbanes Oxley, all of the CFOs and CEOs have to sign off on the financial statements. Okay, so it's just compliance. All right. So that's except for that one error there. I think it's a pretty good deck. Okay, if you guys want more decks, let me know. I have some other ones that. I So that's that. Um, COVID. COVID had an impact on the stock market. Yeah. Do you think it's now an independent variable that should be considered in economic modeling? Probabilities of infection rates. If you're doing, if I'm investing in currency or real estate or fixed income or equities overseas, wouldn't I want to know the, uh, the degree of vaccinations rates? In, in those countries and then figure out what geographic locations and certain demographic economic groups and industry sectors that are benefiting and getting hurt the most. Some of these countries are getting, the Delta is completely, um, it's rapidly infecting um, some of these countries and actually in the Midwest and the South here in the United States which have, have the lowest infection rates, the Delta variant is actually sweeping through those segments of the economy and segments of the country. Is that going to have an impact if they have to resort to lockdowns again? 
Yeah, do we want to go through that again? No. No. So COVID probably is, is one of the number one factors that we as economists have had to take into consideration now. And we look at COVID infection rates. Infection rates, hospitalization, and death rates. Okay. Good news is if you're vaccinated, there's, a, almost, there's no, almost no probability that you're going to die of the, you'll get sick in some cases, but you're probably not going to die because you've been vaccinated. Okay. And most of the infection rates right now on a normal basis are two people who haven't been vaccinated, okay. either because of bad policy or because of bad politics, uh, one of the two. So we're starting to really look at this, and I think this should be in our models. Okay. Um, so there's some trackers here. Here's another trading economics. Um, you may want to go ahead and look at that. Um, that's a pretty good website. Um, I'm giving you the website, my login, and my password for The Economist, if you're interested in that. Okay, I also am giving you Bloomberg, too. I love Bloomberg. I love to you know, study your work, and I got Bloomberg in the background so I can listen to everything that's going on on a global basis. 24 hours a day. Uh, Yahoo Finance, uh, this is actually kind of a go-to site, although um, Yahoo itself is kind of dorky. It used to be a really good website. It's gotten really cheesy. Look, look, at, look at that guy. Um, but here's the thing I like is this menu right here. Okay, so you got basically a dashboard. So what I can do is I can go up to the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I can go back, if I want to, five years, take a look at you know what the trend has been I can go back you know as far as the index goes to you know, and look at you know nothing really happened in the 90s then you had a run up we were basically in a trading range all the way up until about 2008 here's the financial crisis here's over accommodation and monetary policy with pegging interest rates to zero by the Federal Reserve this is where the Federal Reserve tried to taper basically convulsed the market and sent it into a, a psychological, you know, a tailspin. And then they just pump prime the system even more. You had a major correction here, and you could see we're off to the races again. So here's basically the resistance line. Here's the support. Here's the new resistance breakout to the upside. Looks like it broke through its support right there. And where's the, what's the trend in the stock market right now? Going up. What would you be doing? Just based off the technicals. What? Right. Right. If you get what the stock market on Friday closed at its all-time high again. Mm -hmm. okay. If you're not in the market, you're out of the market. If you're out of the market, you're not in the market. If you're not in the market, you can't benefit from this. Okay. Uh, I, I, I went fully invested in 95, and my portfolio is down about 8 to 10 percent per year. Um, since then. If you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. Okay. The S&P 500, you buy an ETF, has done like 8% per year over the last 20, 30 years. Double your money in less than 10 years just buying the index. Okay. If you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. So it's up to you to decide well, what you're going to do. Okay. Um, here's the Dow. There's the S&P 500. There's the NASDAQ, the Russell 2000. Um, here's my oil prices right here. And, de and down below, they'll give, you, um, uh, they'll give you some articles on what's driving the market. Here's the five-year right here. Uh, here's the max. Here's the year-to-date. What's uh, oil prices been doing over the last year? Climbing. Going up. Going up. What does the trend look like? Where do you think oil prices are going to go? Probably going to go up unless OPEC get its gets its stuff together and it decides to uh, start pumping oil into the global markets to bring, basically bring down the prices. But the, but the meeting collapsed last week. So prices look like they're going to continue to go up. And what's happening to the economy in, in China and Europe and the United States? Are we in a recession? No. Are we going into a recession? No. Are we going to, are we going to continue to grow? Yes. And when we grow and economic activity increases, do we consume more uh, oil? Yep. Yep. And that's going to increase Price. demand for oil. What happens if you have increasing demand? Prices go up. So until we see some kind of 
supply or waning demand, prices are probably going to continue to go up. Okay. All right. Uh, prices peaked at about 120 bucks a barrel. If you can see, uh, right before the financial crisis. Okay. And then they got as low as like um, here. This was pandemic. They got as low as eighteen dollars, and now they're at seventy-seven. So there's volatility in there. Traders love volatility. They use economic theories, they use technical analysis, they use statistics to try to predict where they're going to go on a short-term basis, medium-term basis, and a long-term basis, then they place the trades. And a lot of these people are really good, really good traders. Um, there's gold right there. What's gold been doing? Looks like gold peaked out in 2011. Then it came down in 2015. Look at that run up right there. Between December of 19 and then COVID hit, went through the roof. Right? And now what's gold, what's gold been doing? It's been it's trading. Fine. Looks like it's been tra trading, yeah. So is gold a safe haven? Do people go, in the, go into gold when they're scared? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They go into bonds and they go into gold. When they think things are going to be better for the economy and, and the stock market's going to do well, um, what do they do with their gold? Sell it. They sell it and they go into the stock market. And when interest rates get really high, uh, bonds will provide a higher yield to maturity than gold. Gold doesn't pay a dividend. So you get it, it's all capital appreciation from the price and it's more volatile because of that. <clears throat> but if interest rates start to rise and interest rates get high, people are dumping bonds, they're going to, uh, dumping gold and they're going to buy bonds because they can get a coupon interest. So, so traders trade between classic there's the safe, gold and bonds. There's risky, which is the stock market. And they move back and forth okay, based on what they think is going to happen in the future. Okay, that's gold. Uh, who's in um, crypto? No? Everybody's, you know, what was Bitcoin? What did it get, get up to? Like, 64,000. Yeah, and it's at 33 now. So did you, if you had a long position in, in Bitcoin, you lost almost half of your value, right? And it's the same correction that happened in 2018. Major run-up, collapse. Major run-up, collapse. Is Bitcoin uh, volatile? Yes. Yeah. What's the underlying economic factors that drives the intrinsic value of Bitcoin? Essentially, the stock market. Okay, <clears throat> if I was building a model to try to forecast the direction of Bitcoin, what would be the five factors that I would include in my intrinsic valuation model? <clears throat> you said um, stock market. Okay, so stock market variable. The dollar. Uh, it could be the dollar. We'd have to test it, right? See if there's any academic research. Run the correlations and see if there's any correlation between them. So we could maybe interest rates, um, hash rates, uh, market cap, momentum. We could liquidity, we could probably create some factors of our own to be able to come up with a predictive model to predict where Bitcoin prices are. But Bitcoin, is a Bitcoin a sovereign coin? Is it backed by a government, population, and economy? No, it's decentralized. Yeah, it's decentralized finance. So we don't really know what the true intrinsic factors are that drive intrinsic values for Bitcoin. That's probably why we're so volatile. And I got a bunch of my students that are investing in, oh, Professor Susan, should I invest in Bitcoin if you want to. I'm not going to advise you on that. You're totally unsuitable <laughs> for that recommendation. So I'm not going to do that. There's no freaking way. I'm going to lose my license, you know, for giving that advice to you know, my students. <coughs> if you want to do it, do it. <coughs> no, I didn't tell you to do it. Okay. Big charts. Um, seeking Alpha is a good one. I don't know if you can do it free anymore, but you can set it up, pick what you want to be delivered to your email address. It'll spam your email address. I usually go through and check them to look for headlines, economic indicators, and just some major stories. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, big charts right here. This one you should use in your memos. So they're going to give you some of the major news trending right here on the markets, major markets. They're going to be, you know, they're going to give you 
gainers and losers and stuff. But I like to put in the, um, the tickers here <coughs> for either the indexes or the individual stocks or the exchange traded funds. Um, go back three years and then copy and paste those and put those into the memos. Okay, so I'm getting the I'm getting the graphs from the from one source. Okay. Uh, the other one that I like to use um, is stockcharts.com. This one's actually pretty cool. Um, I'm going to just do a demonstration with Apple. What? Apple's a, uh, they do well for the cash flow. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to show you something. Okay. So we're going to do some technical analysis here because basically, as an economist, they really don't talk about this in the book. But as an economist and a trader and an analyst, we're always looking at data and data patterns, data trends. That's technical analysis. The other stuff is fundamental analysis when you're using theories and models. But I like to use both uh, because I can use technical analysis in conjunction with fundamental economic analysis to make better decisions. So here's your Apple. So you guys can follow along if you want to on your computer. So what I do first is I go down here. Can you guys all see this? So down here, I'm going to go to range, and I just like to use a three-year, okay? So I use a three-year, and then I come down here, and in the, in the overlays, I'm going to do a 10-day. I'm going to do a 30-day. And this is your uh, bulletproof, uh, bulletproof investment strategy for trading stocks. It's not a day trading strategy. It's basically a um, conservative trading strategy that uses moving average crossovers to basically pinpoint um, entry and exit points in the individual stocks. Okay. And here's the example right here. So here's a three-year chart for Apple stock. Okay. The 50-day moving average is in green, 30 days in red, and the 10 days in blue. So the 50-day is very slow moving, the 10 days is more sensitive, and the 30-day is somewhere in between. So the technique here, the technical trading strategy, is that when the 10-day crosses the 50-day, that's your buy or your sell alert. Okay, it's alerting you. But when the 10-day and the 30-day crosses the 50, that is your buy and your sell signal. And that's when you execute. Okay? So here, here you can see we started off with the buy. The 10 and the 30 were above the 50. Then the 10 went, then the 30 went, and I sold at, so I bought it at about, I don't know, 48 and sold it at like, let's say 55, okay? And then I was out of the market because the 10 and the 30 were below the 50. The 10 crossed the 30, 50, that's my alert. Then the 30, that's my signal, I bought it. So I bought it at, bought it at 40, and the 10 crossed the 50 and then the 30, and I sold it at basically 48. And then I bought it back at, looks like I bought it back at 48, right there, the 10 and the 30 stayed above the 50, and I bought it at 48, and I sold it at roughly 75, okay? <clears throat> and then I was out, then the 10 day crossed, then the 30 day crossed, that was my buy. I bought it at 70, and it looks like I sold it at 115. I went back in right around there. I think I bought it again, bought, sold in here, but you know, transaction fees are cheap. Then I bought it back at 115. I sold it at 125. I bought it back at 125. It looks as though the 30-day cross, so I'm out of Apple. Looks like, oh, right there. So it looks like the 10-day um, the just crossed, and it looks like right there, probably like two, three days ago, the 30-day crossed the 50, so I'm, I should be long Apple. So what we did in my class with my students in 
my investments class is we programmed this in an Excel spreadsheet and basically calculated the profits that we made um, on 25 stocks implementing the moving day crossover system. Uh, implemented it. Nobody lost money in any of the cases except for the ones that did it wrong. <coughs> and um, we were able to make an additional 10% rate of return on our money. So we were getting a 10 and we made it an extra 10 just by trading the portfolio. So we were able to get 20% uh, out of our portfolio. Okay. And that's a pretty conservative strategy. Okay. All right, any questions on that? And then what you guys should do, and I will give you some advice, um, what you guys should do is um, set up a self-directed IRA if you don't already have one. Um, put some money into the self-directed IRA as a qualified account, which is tax deferred. So you can trade this in your tax deferred account. Again, I'm not making any, giving any investment advice. Um, you can put this in, uh, the money in a, uh, in a qualified tax deferred retirement account. Trade the strategy and not pay any capital gains until you pull the money out at 59 and a half. And then whatever money you pull out, pull out's gonna be contributed to your adjusted gross income and you're gonna pay your taxes at that level after you take your deductions. So it's a pretty awesome system to accumulate wealth for people who are getting in the market that are willing to take the risk to actually trade individual stocks and accumulate you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars over a 30, 40 year period and walk away in your 50s or 60s with at least a, a few million bucks in your pocket if you stick to the program. Okay? And a lot of my students have actually implemented this and made a lot of money over the years. Okay? Just a little food for thought. But it just, this is like the microeconomics um, where you're actually using um, a technical techniques with um, indicators uh, to basically for investment strategy. Okay? Again, it's, I'm teaching applications. Uh, so that's that. Um, here's a video on the, uh, on the, uh, some reviews. Here's some ancient logs. Um, bring your calculators um, towards the end of the class when I start doing the problems so that you're doing the calculations on the intrinsic values with me. Are you guys all versed in calculator, calcul using calculators, exponentials and stuff? You guys know how to use calculators? Or you don't use calculators anymore? No. Okay. Um, and then here are some <coughs> notes from the midterm. Okay, I'm going to go through the midterm. We're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about model, model building again. We're going to talk about unorthodox monetary policy because the book talks about orthodox monetary policy, but we're applying unorthodox monetary policy because what's been going on over the last ten years we've never seen before, and it's not reflected in. Um, I don't know why, it doesn't do a very good job. It just seems to continue to regurgitate, you know, old, you know, myopic theories without taking into consideration the reality of what's actually occurred from the financial crisis, but it doesn't have any COVID in there. And there's gonna be a chapter on COVID's impact on the economy at some point, and maybe you guys will come up with some theory. Uh, here are some more notes, notes. If you're interested in the SIE exam, um, I cut a deal with these guys. It's not really a deal, but a securities trading corporation for like 116 bucks, you can get the uh, test prep to take the exam. I highly recommend it. Okay, highly recommend it. Um, and that's the first step to getting into the business. Okay, and then this is not the syllabus. I don't know what, what that is. I think I, I did it wrong, but I have the syllabus down below. We already went through the statistical pretest. Here's some resources from you. You can use the internet, you can use whatever you want. But what I did was I put into a folder. Oops. I want it. Uh, right here, sorry. Uh, the supplemental information for the pretest. So I have basically four resources that you could use to answer the questions for except for like full day and stuff. And some of the questions on the test, I'm gonna to have to go over again with you because you wouldn't know the answers to those questions unless you took the quad class or you had a background in econometrics or something like that, okay? And I gave you some resources so you don't have to 
dig around, they're all there. And then I also included some notes uh, here uh, that I took from my lectures when, uh, um, for the pretest. So I'm giving you a bunch of stuff. Some people like to do trading games. So there's like half a dozen trading games in there if you want to cut your teeth on options trading, futures trading, stock trading, whatever you want to do. You know, you can even open up an account at TD or Schwab or whatever, do simulated trades. You can do simulated trades on simulated portfolios through Schwab, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. If you want to play, start practicing, this is a great place to, and to do. And if you want to get extra credit or, you know, want to show me that you're doing it, that's, that would be pretty awesome. Yeah, I'll leave that up to you. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, here's the midterm. So I already got the midterm posted. Walk you through it. And then I'm going to go through the midterm. Okay? <clears throat> so what you're going to do is you're going to take notes. I'm going to go through everything. You're going to learn it. And then you're going to post your notes to them. If you want to. So we're going to go through model building, which we already went over. Unorthodox monetary policy, what the Fed has been doing. Uh, we're going to go through yield curves and yield curve dynamics. And the relationship between yield curves and the stock market, I'll show you that. Um, we're going to go through, this is your, um, these are your market updates right there. We're going to do a table where you're going to show me stocks, oil, gold, bonds, U.S. dollar, you know, what the level is, is it up or down, by how much, and what are the factors. Okay, so again, it's just a review. Uh, then we're going to do uh, dynamic asset, uh, asset supply demand analysis. So we're going to apply the supply demand analysis to the major asset classes. And we're going to go through the factors that will shock the supply curve back and out and the demand curve up and down. And I'll, we'll, I'll walk you through that whole thing with the factors. And then that becomes intellectual capital for you to apply to the memos. Okay. Um, so again, application. Then we're going to get into um, financial product innovation and engineering. Okay, um, you guys are all finance majors. Okay, there's no difference that I've learned between Apple Computer or a tech company and a financial services firm. They both hire engineers. One hires financial engineers. The other hires electrical and mechanical engineers. All of the best practices associated with the best companies. Um, are exactly the same, okay? So this is basically a mini lecture on how do financial firms product innovate? What are the necessary requirements to be a product innovator? So we've learned, right, we've got prop tech right now, which is revolutionizing real estate by creating technology companies around real estate applications. We've got FinTech. We've got companies and technology companies that are using high-tech tools and methodologies to create financial products, but also processes, both on the investment management side and the risk management side. So FinTech, all right? This is how these, these, these are how these companies are run. So I'm gonna walk you through the best practices of what are the requirements to basically work in and be part of a firm that's innovative, both product-wise and process-wise. Then we're going to go through and we're going to talk about modern portfolio theory. Okay, have you guys taken the, the portfolio theory class yet? No? Okay. So some of this will be a review or it will be new for you, which is good because before you go to the class, I will have given you a review. Uh, this is the microeconomics of modern portfolio theory. But not only modern portfolio theory, but postmodern portfolio theory basically taking alternative assets and putting them into the portfolio for diversification purposes. And being able to use financially engineered derivative contracts and, pr and products to be able to hedge off the portfolio and apply to the, uh, to the portfolio theory. So I'll walk you through all of that. And then in your portfolio class, you'll be doing all the quantitative analysis behind this thing. But I want to lay out a solid theoretical foundation for you before you walk into that class. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to go through the two scenarios 
when prices, when you forecast prices going up and when you forecast prices going down. Okay? There's two sets of trades. All right? There's a set of trades when prices go up, and there's a set of trades when prices go down. It's binary. You memorize these, these also go in your memo. Okay? So the memo, and I'll go through it next, basically is an integrated learning tool that integrates in not only the economic forecasting, but also the finance tools to benefit from your forecast, along with supporting evidence and information in a one-page tool to be presented as a training, training document, a training tool that goes to the senior managing principal of the company that he or she can look at and approve. And if they approve it, you probably have 25 to $250 million in your capital account to be able to execute on those trades if they're approved by the managing partner. So if you're good at your trading and your finance and your economics and your IT, um, you are the managing director and you're going to be overseeing your division. And they're going to give you money to trade. And then it's up to you. you know? And most people are extremely successful. And now they have technology. Okay? So it's totally, over the last five years, the technological applications to finance is revolutionary. Okay? Or evolutionary, depending on how you do. And then I'll walk you through some microeconomics using the technical analysis, which I just talked to you about. We'll do a little intrinsic valuation work um, there. Oops. And then you don't have to worry about the, uh, the questions at the end here. You don't have to do any of these. Okay. So that's kind of the, that's the midterm piece. Okay. Okay, got it. I haven't done the... <clears throat> so here's just all syllabus right there. That's where you want to get it. Class schedule. Midterms again. Textbook. Here's all of your resources. So I got the PowerPoints. I got teaching guides. I got the, the instructor guides. I got the solutions to the homeworks. I got solutions to the essay questions. You don't have to worry about these essay questions. Um, so you have all the resources there to be able to answer the questions. Okay? And you don't have to worry about Welsh. Um, writing. You, do you, you guys don't take a communications class, do you? No, so they assume you're a good writer. What? Not only do they assume you're a good writer, but you, they assume you're a good business writer. Is there a difference between writing in English for English classes and writing for business at the marketing level for industries that are highly competitive? Yeah. It's a totally different style. Okay? And if you don't have it, I'll train you. I'll help you with the memos. I'll walk you through when you do the memos. I'll help you edit your memo so I can train you on how to write business quality. Business, most students write in past tense. Okay? They add too many words. <clears throat> They're not, um, they don't use subject verb agreements and they don't know how to use conjunctions. Okay? <clears throat> They're too wordy. Um, they use slang um, and it's just not gonna fly. On a website or in a professional document or investment brief, going to a senior level executive investment committee, a senior level manager, the senior, you know, the board of directors, a sophisticated institutional client, consultant, or uh, an advisor. That's the biggest complaint that I got. Because like, your students, even students at Cal and Stanford, they can't write. You guys, you, we, you know, we, we hire these people, we gotta train them how to write. Um, will you do me a favor, Larry, <clears throat> and then walk them through some templates and teach them, do some remediation so that when we hire them, at least, you know, they, they can write. Because what happens a lot is that is the, uh, the newly hired uh, will submit something to the managing director. The managing director will correct it, give it back to them. They'll hand it back in. The managing director has to correct it again. They hand it back to them. The, they, then they correct it and give it back to the managing director, and they got to correct it again. The managing director has to correct it three times. Is that a waste of time? And I find out that a lot of my undergrads that didn't go through my program, <coughs> what happens is when the managing director gives them feedback, they take it personally and they get mad at the managing director for giving them feedback on the writing. 
that person's not going to last. Right? No, I'm not going to get a hard time from, from somebody. I'm going to tell them, I'm going to train them on how to do the writing. And if they can't pick it up, I'll find somebody who can. Uh, so here are some review videos for you. Uh, macroeconomics, monetary policy, micro stats, probabilities, regression, calculus, matrix algebra, time series forecasting, um, econometrics, and people who are really interested in finance, which I am totally interested in, is uh, quantitative finance. Uh, financial econometrics. Basically taking the economics and learning how to build the models and applying the econometrics and the statistics to finance. Okay, so if you're interested in that, um, this is a master's in finance. This is not a master's in financial engineering. Okay? You go to Berkeley to get that or NYU or something like that. Okay? But you may want to go up to the MFE, Master's in Financial Engineering program at Berkeley, and just take a look at the course contents. You know, what are, and most of those students are PhDs in physics that go do that program. Or they're mathematicians or engineering students. So they got all the quad background. But you guys, being master's in finance students, should understand, at least know, um, what is computational finance and what is financial economics. Because okay? you may want to move into that direction. You guys might want to go get trained in R and Python and be able to do more sophisticated you know, analytic techniques you know, based off of your, what you're learning here in this program. Okay? So you don't have to go do an MFE. You just need maybe more, some, some more programming. Financial accounting, financial statement analysis, financial ratio analysis. So this is basically just a review section for you to help remediate. Okay, I'll let you. Oh, here are some of the the memo templates that you want to use, and I'll spend the last 15 minutes going over uh, the memo, and then the rest of it's just you don't have to worry about it. Go ahead. Uh, so you know, like with all the like derivatives and like we can see like where kind of like the market's going. Uh, I know you said that there was like part where the Federal Reserve was kind of late into fixing it, right? So what, what was kind of like the error that prevented them? Oh, the the, the derivatives. Yeah. During the financial crisis. Uh -huh. Yeah. <coughs> what happened was there was um, there was there, there is what is called neoliberalism, okay. Uh, which is really adoption of free market capitalism, laissez-faire deregulation, as opposed to Keynesianism, which is more regulated markets, more participation of governments and institutions to regulate excesses, excesses particularly in the financial marketplaces. So when Bill Clinton signed the graham leach Bliley Act in 1989, <clears throat> sorry, um, in 2000, he dere deregulated the financial institutions basically allowing for financial institutions, particularly commercial banks, to basically merge with investment banks, which was a repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act in 1930, okay? So what happened was, over time, because of de deregulation, these banks started taking capital, savers, money, and then leveraging up their balance sheet to get capital and started trading and betting amongst each other in forwards and futures and CDOs and other derivative contracts, racking up these huge contingent liabilities, basically a pyramid scheme. And at some point in time, some of the market makers realized that a lot of these deriv derivative contracts were worthless because they were based, the basis, the collateral that were, the, 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 the underlying basis of these contracts were worthless. And at some point in time, the market started crashing. The housing market, the mortgage market, the residential mortgage securities market, the stock market, and the Federal Reserve came in, printed trillions of dollars, bought up all of that crap off of the bank's balance sheet and stuck it onto the Federal Reserve's balance sheet and cleaned up the system. And it was the same uh, bank or CEO that were that are sitting on the Federal Reserve? So the Federal Reserve basically bought all that stuff, worked it out, and basically unwound a lot of those positions. But the Federal Reserve balance sheet, I'll go over this in the lecture, took, went from a billion dollars in assets, I'm mean, sorry, a trillion dollars. Their balance sheet went from a trillion dollars to over eight trillion in 10 years. 
So they used to hold the balance sheet of treasury securities where they would just conduct open market operations to regulate um, interest rates, to regulate the economy. Now the Federal Reserve is the not only the lender of last resort, but it's the market maker of last resort and the portfolio manager of last resort. It basically makes a market in U.S. Treasury. It's the biggest holder of government debt. It's the biggest holder of residential mortgage-backed securities. If the Fed under, uh, ever unwound their positions or stopped trade, stopped buying those securities, the markets would collapse. That's where we are. That's the 300-pound gorilla in the room that senior-level executives are talking about, okay? And you want to be in the room, okay? You want to be in that room. So here's the memo. This is a template. You're going to do five memos. You're going to do a stock market memo, an oil memo, a gold memo, a bond memo, and a U.S. dollar, foreign currency. Uh, this is the way it should look, okay? Exactly, okay? So I've already posted on there the word templates. You use the template so you don't have to worry about the formatting. Because when you go to a firm, what they're going to say is, this is what I want you to do, and here's the template that you're going to use. No, I think I'm going to do it my way, and I'm going to change the template. Because I think I, this is a better way to do it. What's going to happen? It's not going to fly. Because how many of these memos do I look at? Five per student. How many times do I look at it over the semester? Three times. I'm looking at these memos like 500 times. So if, there, if there's a different format for every memo, that's it. I'm canceling the exercise because I can't. I don't have enough time to basically review everything. But if it's in a standardized form, I can scan it very quickly, correct it, give you feedback, and you move on. Okay. So memo capitalized, bolded, one-inch margins around the top and the sides. You can leave the uh, take the bottom one to 0.5. <clears throat> Date to from R E bolded colons indented tabs over so it's flush. You got the date, you got to me, from you, global stock prices forecast to fall 4% over the next three months. What are we forecasting? From the very first sentence, what are we forecasting? Stock prices. Stock prices. How much, do, what's, what's your opinion? 4% drop. 4% drop over what period of time? Yes. Is that all you need to know? So I got, I, I totally hooked the reader right there off the first sentence. That's business. And then your, your template is exactly like this. You're using exactly the same language, the same format. You're just changing out the factors. We are tracking, you could use global stock prices or just stock prices. Based on our research, Collar, we forecast global stock prices to fall 5% over the next three months based on the following factor, factors. Rising global growth, economic growth. Would that cost stock prices to go up? Increases in consumer price index. Yeah, maybe I wouldn't use increases. I would have said rising inflation expectations. Okay. And rising gold prices. Yeah, this is pretty good. It's okay. Therefore, we recommend the following 36 trades. We are trading three stock indexes. CAL, BIN, and GDAO. Okay, so I guess these are global stock indexes. I would have had the Dow. S&P 500 and NASDAQ, okay? Uh, we have three indexes, four trades, for a total of 12 index trades. We're gonna buy, we're gonna, uh, because they're gonna fall, we're writing forwards, writing futures, writing calls on futures, and buying puts on futures for the indexes. Uh, for the ETFs, we found three exchange traded funds. You can go Google and say, you know, S&P 500 exchange traded funds on. I'm going to give you the ticker. You can go into them. Um, that's all you got to do is just put three ETF tickers right there. Uh, if you think that the ETF share prices are going to fall, you're going to sell short, write calls, buy puts. If you think that the stock prices are going to fall, you're going to sell short, write calls, buy puts. So these two are exactly the same. This is exactly the way it's supposed to look. Nice and tight, and then you put the ticker symbols for the individual stocks right there, right justified within the cell, nicely compact, beautiful memo. So right off the bat, we know the thesis, the factors, the direction, the time period, the trades. Now what we have is we basically have our evidence, our bullets. 
that basically are the data that supports the direction and the forecast that justifies the trends. Okay? And then we have our technical analysis over here. We've got our graphs. So I got technical analysis, I've got fundamental analysis, I'm bolting basically the data within the bullets because we're data junkies and we scan these things and we memorize the data that you're providing us so that we can regurgitate that data to the clients and senior level executives in meetings and in calls. Okay? And then what you do is you basically replicate the thesis, intro thesis statement, you copy it, you paste it down here, you change following to above, the, oh, that's wrong, that should be a semicolon to a period, and why would I replicate and restate the thesis statement at the end of the memo? Leave them with the final thought. Yeah, you're, you're selling them. Right. Right? You hook them, you hook them here, right? Uh, you laid out your case, you told them the solution, you supported, you know, your, your view, and you hit them again between the eyes and you close the deal. Right? Because you gotta re you gotta tell you gotta remind people. Based on our research, uh, we think that stock price is going to fall 6% or whatever it is, 5% over the next three months. Here's our trade recommendations on the indexes, on the ETFs, and the stocks. We have 36 ways that you can profit from our economic forecast, in our view. So we're completing five for the entire course? Just you one. do stocks first. Once you've completed it, you set up a meeting with me. I go over it with you. We set a solid template, swap out stocks for oil, then gold, then bonds, and then the US dollar. And then the supply demand analysis that I go over in the midterm is going to give you some idea of these factors. The factors are also going to be mentioned in the articles that you read when you do the research. There's only two sets of trades when, when stock prices go up, go down, and when stock prices go up, let's see if there's another one. So this is exactly the trades that you're going to use if you think prices are going to go down. Okay? So there's, it's binary. There's only two sets of trades, derivative trades. And then I'll do a, um, I'll do a uh, derivatives, you know, uh, a review on forwards, futures, you know, option contracts, you know, what is buying on margin, what's selling short, so I'll walk you through and do an intro on the trade. This, this economics course, financial economics course, would be a good course for you, not only for review from your prior courses, but also for your courses going forward. Okay, so I'm really focusing on financial economics in this class in monetary and fiscal policy. Okay. And then here's the, um, this is what Katie did for the, uh, the oil memo. So there's going to be, you can use the same factors in your justification for the direction if it makes economic sense, okay? You can use some of the same bullets across the different memos if they make economic sense, okay? If they don't, then they shouldn't be in there, okay? And then here are the, um, actually she did this wrong. That's not correct. I should have, I should have given her a B. <laughs> No, she was one of my most brilliant students that I ever had. At one point she was like, she, in my other classes, like in my um, investments in my um, international finance, uh, the students are doing a lot of the problems on the board. Uh, they're doing PowerPoint presentations. Um, other students are coaching other students on the projects once they've reached certain milestones. And then basically I just go around and I consult and advise. So I'm doing pro project management, program management, doing value add on the spot, um, uh, value, right? instead of blah, blah, blah stuff up here. I'm right there with them one on one or in teams. Uh, this one's not correct either. Hold on. Hold on, and then I'll be done. I got like three minutes. I just got to find the one. Anybody have any questions? Okay, here we go. Uh, so here's the sets of trades for when you think prices or the value of the U.S. dollar is going to go up. Buy forwards, buy futures, buy calls on futures, write puts on futures. Buy a margin, buy calls, write puts. Buy a margin, buy calls, write puts. Two sets of trades, binary. 
Think prices are going up? Use that. Think prices are going down? Use the other. That's it. Okay? So the only thing that really changes, and again, you can leverage your memos either by the factors of the bullets or the graphs if it makes economic sense for that asset. I don't know about you guys, but I'm done. <laughs> I, need, I need a cocktail now. <laughs>